before we get involved in the feedback issue, <laughs> as, a, as a loud professor from New York, I normally don't have problems being heard. I could do this tone or I could put on the microphone. Folks in the back? Perfect. All right. There you go. Unless you like feedback, in which case we could all pretend that we're at my like seventh grade dance. All right. So before we begin, I would just like to, to point out um, the, the most wonderful uh, introduction to this, which is killing librarianship. But I don't know if you noticed on the way in through this door, this is the sign telling you what was coming up. <laughs> So, so I know where I will be at 2.15. Um, that, was, that was good. What will kill our profession is not e-books, Amazon, or Google, but a lack of imagination. Um, you know, I've looked through the program. You guys have a great couple of days ahead of you. And there's like full of content from everything from social networking and collection development and change management and dealing with unruly patrons and apparently a whole session on dealing with unruly keynotes. And <laughs> as a keynoter, this is fabulous because when you're part of such a strong presentation, there's absolutely no obligation to have content in your presentation. <laughs> so I am, I'm going to, uh, to, to take that advantage of that and not have any content to what I'm going to say. But what does this mean? What this means is, uh, it, was, it was in the midst of a wonderful talk. Uh, it was in Edmonton, Alberta, and uh, this line came out. And people seemed to like it, but no one quite knew what it meant. Um, and, but what it means is that we live in an era when we need to think big. So what I would ask you to do for the next 45 minutes or so is Take advantage of the fact that you're not sitting in a library trying to figure out where the toner cartridges are, pointing to where the bathroom is. Or, as I understand it, the number one reference question has been replaced. It is no longer where's the bathroom. It's now, have you found a USB stick? Yeah. Is that? All right. So let's take advantage of the fact that we're in lovely Burlington, and it's 43 degrees outside. We don't want to go anywhere. And spend some time thinking big, because we are in a time where we desperately need to think big. We are in a time where everyone uses the word unprecedented after every other statement. Right? <laughs> Somewhere, someone's talking about an unprecedented challenge in accountancy, or something of that nature. Right? Everyone's dealing with unprecedented change, great change, whatever, whatever. And it's true. That's the worst part of it, right? The worst part of it is we do live in an era where we are faced with enormous challenges, where we are faced with big problems. And this is not the time to shy away from them. This is not the time, if we're going to talk about what the new normal is, the new normal can't be introversion, hiding in our shelves, hoping it goes away. We deal with this in higher education. It's not like, well, you know, once this whole economic thing shifts out, people will be willing to spend $300 million a year in tuition. We'll just have to wait it out. Right? If you look at some of the reasons we need to think big, this is from the Adult Education Commission. And what it does is it's got, it's a graph by country. Each, each line's a country. Thank you. The red dots, these are 45 to 54 folks. The green dots are folks 25 to 34. And what you're seeing is the percentage of folks who have, a, I believe it's an under, a high school degree, high school diploma. All right? So you can see, for example, in picking one fun, in Poland, you can see that what happens is generational differences, kind of what you would expect. Right? The young are getting more educated than the adults. But I want to point out this particular line, which happens to be the United States. And you'll notice something interesting about the chart, which is the red square is above the green diamond. Now, it's not way above. And frankly, we're way up at the top, so we should be pretty happy with ourselves until you look over at something like Korea. Korea is way above us, and they started much farther behind us. One of the big challenges where we need big ideas is in how we educate ourselves, how we prepare for this world. We hear all the time that education is vital, that college education is important, that college is the key to innovation, economic development, la, 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 and I'm a professor, so I throw that line out whenever I can. 
except that we happened in 2010 was the first time where academic debt surpassed credit card debt in this country. And it is not because we've been paying our credit cards back so well. <laughs> and partly it is. The line, the line, you eat, we've been doing pretty well. It turns out that when you don't eat, you don't charge a lot of things. But that graph's going down sort of like inch by inch, and the academic one's doing this. This chart shows since 1982 the growth in percentage growth in different areas. College tuition's up the top at about 450 percent. Medical care is only 250 percent. It is costing us more to get healthy, but it costs us a heck of a lot more to get smarter, supposedly. All right? Now, this in the midst of the most dramatic uh, wage and wealth distribution in this country that we see that the top 5% control something like 60% of the wealth in this country, we're dealing with the shrinking middle class, that we are in an, almost a 10% unemployment over that in certain sectors so that one out of 10 people you know has been laid off. We're in an era, era of great division in our politics where we're just sort of figuring out, hey, do we really need a federal government? Let's see. Right? <laughs> no, I'm not, that could be the rest of the talk. I'm not going there. <laughs> the point is, we have big challenges before us. We, we are, they are living in interesting times. I once said, we live in Shakespearean times. We live in times where we could be writing those dramas, where we're talking about regime change, and we're talking about population growth. We're talking about a massive demographic shift. We're about to go from a country with a white majority to a plurality. We've got many states in which now the Hispanics represent a larger percentage of population than all other demographics combined, and soon than the Caucasian. Now, I think that's a good thing. I think diversity is interesting. But I think it's a challenging thing. When we deal with language issues, when we deal with collection issues, when we deal with all of these issues, we're living in that time. Now, I got to thinking about all of this because um, we, Neil Gabler wrote this wonderful article in the Sunday Review of the New York Times talking about the elusive big idea. And within it, and I'll, by the way, all these, I'll put all the slides online. You can copy and paste to your, to your delight. Um, he talked about we're at sort of at the death of ideas, that we're at a post-idea economy. And it was sort of interesting to think about that. Now, uh, he sort of overstates some of the issues, but his basic line is, look, we used to think big thoughts, we used to make celebrities out of our sort of thinkers, and now we make celebrities out of people who are celebrities, right? I mean, who forgot their underwear when they went out to a bar. Really, this... Einstein, you know, Lindsay Lohan. I don't know. <laughs> so you can challenge it, but it really did get me thinking. And what it got me thinking about is that if library, libraries and librarians are in the knowledge business, if we're in the learning business, if we're in the education business, and I argue that we are, we actually have two rather amazing challenges before us. Now, the first one I'm going to pick on is the obvious one, right? So if you haven't seen it, go read this lovely article, Save Our Libraries, Fire the Librarians. Um, it was in the News Leader, uh, Florida's oldest weekly newspaper, um, right up there with the old gray lady. And Mike Thompson wrote this, and it's just lovely, right? Why do we need a new library? I don't know what, how old, but why do we need a new library? Get those kids off my yard, whatever it is. And, and I know it's deathly to bring up large blocks of text, but it's so worth it. Stick with me for a moment. <laughs> while, local tax, while local taxpayers <laughs> pick up the biggest tab for America's libraries, most librarians are little more than unionized pawns for the social activist bosses of the American Library Association. <laughs> wow, all right. Today, 136 years after its formation, ALA controls 62,000 members and through its czarist accreditation program of many libraries, largely dictates what books are available for the most impressionable members of the US society, our children. I hear you, comrades, I really do. 
called a communist for the first time the other day. I thought, you know, it's interesting when you have, when someone does that, you have an interesting reaction. The first one is, but I buy stuff, right? <laughs> and the second one is, what are you wearing, a leisure suit? Communism? Really? Come on. All right. And, and when that person hears this webcast, I can't wait for the comments. Anyway. <laughs> So we have this line, right? We go and we talk to librarians, and many, many a librarian has come up and said, the tea partiers are destroying us. I got people who don't understand. People don't believe in libraries anymore. People are small-minded. People are And I'm not going to be here to argue that everyone has an equally valid thing to say about the world, right? So we have this sort of anti-intelligentsia, anti-library feel out there. And it is very real. We are dealing with that, and we have to deal with it. And I think that's kind of interesting. But what really got me thinking about the big idea one was that I think we have a rather interesting second front that's opening up, second problem. And it can be represented by this. Now, I don't think you know what Clue is. Clue is the next big thing. What Clue does, and I know you can't read that, so I'll tell you, you can go with your smartphone and walk through New York City, and when you have to go to the bathroom, I'm not making this up, you can rent people's bathrooms. I don't know if it's by the hour. I don't. Right. And, and if you don't like this one, here's, my, here's another one. Fakegirlfriend.co. Now, this one you probably can read, so you're welcome to try it out on your phones. Now, you, you um, save this number. It says girlfriend. You send a text to this number, and what happens is you'll get responded with a random girlfriend-esque message. About a minute later, the fake girlfriend will call you with a pre-recorded message, and after you hang up, tell everyone how great your girlfriend is. <laughs> That's just so sad, you know? <laughs> the, the, reason, the reason I bring this up is that this is a startup, and my God, someone will probably give them a check, right? The opposite side of this equation from people who don't necessarily believe in libraries, missions, in knowledge, and education, all this other stuff, is those that seek to take ideas and monetize them as fast as they can, right? That what we have is we have a plethora of small ideas. And these small ideas aren't bad, it's just a matter that there's this drive to monetization. That the way that all economic development is going to happen in Connecticut or Rhode Island or here in Vermont is that everyone's going to start their own business. And I think there's actually a lot of valid, and we're going to talk about a lot of valid things to entrepreneurship, to innovation, to startups. But the problem is it quickly becomes, why think about it if you can't monetize it? And what you can monetize tends to be a lot smaller than the issues that we're facing. That what we, you know, wow, we can do moped delivery of cat food. Get me to a venture capitalist and let me patent that before anyone does it, right? This doesn't say, hey, we can solve democracy, right? How do you monetize, well, once again, monetizing democracy, we have the federal government, but we'll keep going. This, what we have are things like this me too mentality that we go in and, well, it's Facebook, but it's not exactly Facebook, right? It was like when Google Plus came out. What's Google Plus? Facebook with circles. <laughs> how many of you, you don't have to admit if you started the conversation, but how many of you at one point were in a meeting where you said, boy, the library could start its own Facebook for Enter City Here, right? We could do our own social network. And the answer is, why? It's there. But we get this, this shows up in things like patent trolls. There are huge industries, huge companies that do nothing but own intellectual property for the only purpose to go sue people who are actually producing things. Google recently bought Motorola. They didn't do it so they could bring back the little track, track phones. They did it for their portfolio of IP, for their portfolio of patents that could help them defend against Apple, fight against Apple. When you look at what Apple's doing with its market, with its iPhone and its iPad, they're now in Korea and they're now in Germany. They're actually trying to prevent competitors from putting tablets on the market. They're not doing it by outbidding them. They're not doing them by outpricing them. They're doing them by suing them. They're saying this is too like RIP, sue them. Now, I want to be really clear. I am not a communist. And so 
I believe in intellectual property. I believe there's an appropriate use of intellectual property, but we're getting to the point when Amazon can patent the idea of one-click purchasing. We've gone a bit too far. Right? So you have this opposite pressure on libraries. Why go to the library 